Vrolijk Kerstfeest. Vrolijk Kerstfeest, which is, of course, Dutch for Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. So we're doing these bonus episodes, Al, um, of We Have Ways of Making You Talk, and we're taking it in turns to read extracts from some of our favourite World War II books. Yep. And your first, 23rd of December. What's it going to be? Well, um, I thought in the spirit of seasonal exhaustion, I'd read a passage <laughs> from um, Zeno's The Cauldron, where yes. um, he's not the hero, but he's the protagonist. Bridgman is It's towards the end of the battle in the Oosterbeek perimeter, and Bridgman is very, very tired. The air hung nearly as thickly as the puffs of smoke which drifted heavily round the edges of the perimeter, marking its limits as clearly as a crayoned line on a map. In shattered buildings and from the holes dug in the gardens of the houses, from the borders' positions in the fields and from those of the glider pilots under the trees, the division fought on, battalions reduced to tens of men, companies to single figures, platoon positions held by five or six men, section posts manned by pairs and sometimes by a single soldier. Each man alone, no man an island, all tied together by the thread of the general's command. The despair in their hearts hidden, or at worst partially concealed from each other. The dead blankness of exhaustion masking their faces to a uniform, dirty, grey yellowness. The independent company clung to its houses in Oosterbeek, the approach roads into its positions cluttered with burned-out tanks and half-tracks. Bridgman walked and crawled his rounds from post to post, fatigue, bitterness and anger fighting for first place in the turmoil of discontent which sucked at his rationality, urging him constantly to some course of action which would upset the status quo. Death, for himself or his men, was now something relatively unimportant. What mattered more was the manner in which it would come. He felt a great need to be free, if only for a few minutes, from the encircling grip of the German army. There were many ways of dying in the field, but falling one by one, the slow harvest of attrition, this was the worst way of all. Bridgman halted behind the cover of some bushes between Blake's house and the stable where Brogan tended the most recently wounded. He was on his hands and knees, and he sat back till his buttocks rested on his Achilles tendons, drawing his hands in so that his arms hung limply by his sides, the knuckles of his open fists brushing the leaf mould below the stretch muscles of his thighs. His head sank forward till his chin rested on his chest, and he closed his eyes. The desire for sleep was the most persistent sensation he had ever experienced. He would have sacrificed anything for a few hours sleep, anything but his pride in the remnants of his command. O'Neill no longer crawled after him. In the last minutes of daylight on the previous evening, just as they were entering the single house still manned by Blake and his men, a German sniper in the roof of the hospital had shot O'Neill, cleanly, high up in the forehead, killing him so quickly that he looked in death as calm and dispassionate as he had in life. His dark, satinine face with its thin lips turned down, his chin raised slightly, a sluggish breeze stirring his fine dark hair. He had lain as if looking at the sky through half-closed lids. Bridgman shifted, resting one hand on the back of his neck, pulling down on the tired muscles. He shook his head gently from side to side, but the image of the dead German Jew persisted. He sighed. Who had the greater cause, the O'Neills or men like himself? If he lived, he would return to his own country, to his wife and son and daughter. If O'Neill had escaped death, he would have returned to what? To nothing but the knowledge that he had helped to rid the world of oppression, to make it a place where Jews and anyone else might just live free of the fear of subjection and death. Other Jews, Jews other than his own family, who were already dead in the camps of Dachau or Belsen, or had simply disappeared from the face of the earth without their own kin being aware of their going. He would rest for just a minute more. Then he would go on to Brogan. Perhaps the orderly would have a brew ready. It would be good if Brogan did have tea. It would be wonderful to drink again the tea that Anne made. Hot tea from cool hands. One placing the cup and saucer, the other touching his shoulder and drifting up to the hair on his nape. Fondling and enticing till the maleness rose suddenly in him and reaching out he pulled her to him while the tea in the thin china cup grew cold. To sit with her half sideways on his knee, his face buried in the soft cool warmth of her breasts, his free hand stroking the firm beauty of her thighs while they both considered how they might anticipate the night. Between the bush and the garden wall his body sagged slowly until his right shoulder touched the brickwork. 
In a few minutes, he would go on to Brogan. The orderly would have only two men with him, neither very badly wounded. If Brogan thought they would be all right, he would send them back to their sections. His buried head touched the wall and his mouth opened. The sudden, drenching saliva of exhaustion running out from his lips and soaking the camouflaged veil he wore round his neck. His will fought the exhaustion without his being aware of it, so that instead of the blank insensibility of sleep, he drifted for a minute-long age, half-conscious. Brogan stood back in the shadows of the stable, which ran at right angles to the wall against which Bridgman had halted. At first he thought his platoon commander had been hit, but watching him slowly keel over towards the wall, the medical orderly realised that Bridgman had been overcome by exhaustion. Brogan watched the camouflage smock and the red beret above it, then turned back into the stable, one hand rubbing his auburn hair, the other brushing up the bristles of his thick moustache. He sat down on a broken chair and wondered disjointedly what he ought to do. He coughed, an irritable cough, which eased his momentary dissatisfaction with himself. To have to sit and wonder whether or not to bring Bridgman in was absurd. Three, even two days ago, he would not have had to give the action a second thought. Perhaps it was better to leave him, to allow him the rest he would not allow himself, but Brogan knew that that was not the reason which kept him seated in the stable. It was not fear either. He was past fear, as he was past every other strong emotion. It was simply that he had not the energy to drag himself out to where the platoon commander crouched against the wall, oblivious to the battle and his responsibilities. If he went and couldn't wait Bridgman, he would have to carry him in. Bridgman was a big man. At the best of times, it would have been a difficult job. Now it would be impossible. Brogan stood up and looked at the two men on the makeshift trestle bed. Neither was badly hurt, but anything more than an average effort would start them bleeding again. He went to the door and stared back to where Bridgman lay. He hadn't moved. Brogan blew his breath out in a great gust, an explosion of sound that was half a sob and half a cry for help. Tears of weakness formed in his eyes and one trickled down his cheek. The medical orderly straightened up. He squared his shoulders, theatrically, but the gesture was for his own benefit. There was no other audience to appreciate it. He opened the lower half of the door and made his way along the wall. As Brogan bent over the officer, Bridgman opened his eyes and stared up at him. Brogan saw impressions flash in the mirror of Bridgman's eyes. Bewilderment, apprehension, surprise, and then... understanding. Neither man spoke, and when Brogan held out his hand, Bridgman ignored it. Instead... He pulled himself laboriously to his feet like a man rising under a load. He walked slowly towards the stable, gripping the sling of his sten gun as if it would support him. Brogan followed half a pace behind. The German stepped out from a gap beyond the stable, and at first he did not see them. His rifle was slung on his shoulder, and he looked very spruce and clean, as if he had slept well the night before and shaved himself that morning. His middle-aged face wore a puzzled look. He was lost. Bridgman's thoughts stumbled out to his limbs in a single uncoordinated words, and his hands hesitated. As his right hand slid up the sling of his sten, the German saw him for the first time. Still groping at his shoulder, Bridgman was astonished at the speed with which the German moved. The man already had his rifle off his shoulder, and the barrel was rising fast. When the shots came three in succession. They sounded inside Bridgman's head so that he thought he was feeling them and not hearing them. He got his sten off his shoulder while he waited for the pain, but the German fell even as he pressed the trigger, and the nine millimetre bullets passed above the grey uniform and the outflung arms. Alan turned to speak to Brogan and found the medical orderly alongside him, a Canadian 45 automatic, thrust out level with his waist and a look of astonished satisfaction on his face. That's the first time I've ever fired the bloody thing. I didn't even aim it. He turned to Bridgman, his face breaking into a delighted smile, which lit up his whole personality and chased the weariness away. Bridgman grinned back ruefully. It's a good thing you didn't. You might have missed. A pistol's like a shotgun, largely a matter of instinct. He paused and then went on. I'm glad you were here. My reflexes were gone. I was, I was caught flat-footed. I shouldn't have stood a chance. They went together into the stable, looked at the two wounded men and spoke to them. The men were not eager, but both were prepared to rejoin their sections, and Brogan and Bridgman stood at the door and watched them as they made their way across the gardens. Brogan broke the silence. I, I suppose I shouldn't have shot that chap. In other units, no members of the REMC carry weapons. We were always told that we were only to fire to protect our own lives. 
At any rate, I'm glad I did it. Bridgman found it strange that in war, a soldier should have doubts about killing. He supposed that Brogan did not really see himself as a soldier. I shouldn't worry, Brogan, he said. After he'd shot me, you'd have been protecting your own life. You just anticipated events by a few seconds. I'm very pleased you did. Bridgman put his hand to the door to open it, and then, with no warning at all, he was on the ground, his body sprawled in complete unconsciousness. I mean, I I think what's remarkable about that is, because um, he was there, because M- Zeno, whatever his name, Macquarie, was there, Yeah, you really get the feeling that um, that's what that was like. Right. And sometimes I think, I mean, I've just been reading another book called Flamethrower, <laughs> uh, which is a guy in a crocodile church yeah. tank, and he writes about it called by Andrew Wilson, and Wilson is written about in the third person, and he does an explanation at the beginning of it, just saying I just felt it was easier to write, sort of almost fictionalise this, and I think that's the same with, with sta- Zeno, yeah. isn't it? To stand back just, from it a little, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, gives yeah. Him, it just gives him a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a. I'm fascinated by that novel because because I've, I mean, I've read an awful lot about Arnhem and. and First person accounts and accounts by, uh, interestingly, by um, uh, officers who were making decisions and stuff was you know uh, he was only ever he was only ever a, um, a platoon commander so he he wasn't involved right. in any of the like right we're going to do this now he was involved in the day to day management of the situation right in front of him and that really comes across in this book Cause, you know I've read you've, I've read Hackett's accounts and. Jeffrey Powell, who's a company commander, and people like that, and Frost's accounts and Urquhart's accounts, but then to to actually have someone who's sort of at the at the coal force a bit more, yeah, coal face rather a bit more is um is fascinating. It's a it's a great book. Thank you, Al. That was uh, the Cauldron by Zeno, um, and Happy Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs>